Board meeting with the clerk, please. Start with the pledge. To the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Yeah. Secretary Treasurer Horowitz. Here. Trustee Pell is absent. Trustee Stafford. Here. Trustee Welker. Here. Sir, we have a quorum present this evening. So we have a couple of discussions with you. Hey, Ed, can you speak in? Thank you. Sorry. Is that better? Yes. yes. Uh, we have a couple of discussions on the agenda to start the meeting off. The first one is Joyce, Joyce Novak, PhD, Program Director, Peconic Estuary. Uh, and this is your. Uh, yes. Welcome. And Hi. So um, I'm here tonight to talk to you about the National Estuary Program in the Peconics here on the east end of Long Island. For those of you who don't know, um, the Peconic Estuary is designated by Congress in 1992 um, as an estuary of national significance. Uh, we're mandated under the Clean Water Act, Section 303D, um, and we're billed as a partnership organization. So we have a management and a policy committee. Um, that consists of Suffolk County members, state members, federal members from the EPA, representatives from the East End towns, and nonprofit partners. And one of our main goals is to develop management plans for best practices within the estuary, um, which includes uh, everything from habitat restoration to uh, clean water policies and uh, zoning and recommendations for um, planning uh, in the East End towns. Um, so a couple of projects that we do that I wanted to talk to you tonight, and I do apologize, um, I'm a little technology short this evening, so you're just gonna have to listen to me with no visuals. Um, but we've been working really hard um, with our local partners to carry out some alewife fish pass projects along the Peconic River, um, allowing the fish to pass the dams um, in order to be able to breed and to become replenished from their um, current numbers. So one of the projects we were involved in is there's a nature way fish pass right over there in Riverhead. Um, where we came together to get money. Uh, it's quite successful. This season we put in a counter and a camera and the population estimates, um, which were previously unknown, are around 40 to 50,000 fish in the season. Uh, we were really excited to hear that information because that means the passes that we have on deck uh, upriver of that will really open up um, a lot of habitat for uh, the alewife populations. Alewife are important because they are a uh, a feed fish for many species, and they allow larger species um, to utilize and thrive in the peconics. So that's one project that we do. We work on wetland and eelgrass restoration projects uh, throughout the estuary, and we've most recently completed a living shoreline um, project uh, out in Greenport, uh, and we're working on completing one uh, in the town of Southhold by Cedar Beach. Uh, these are important because our new conservation management plan, which is due out in January and will guide our actions uh, and actions of our partners for the next 10 years, advocates a no net increase in hardened shorelines within the Peconics. Um, so what we're doing is developing different uh, nature-based solutions, which is a combination of submerged and onshore grasses um, that can carry out the same function as a bulkhead, um, but also then allows for the natural sediment uh, redistribution in the area. Uh, it gives wildlife habitat and can really set the stage for a way uh, forward uh, in terms of coastal resiliency uh, and managing some of the, the problems that we have ahead of us. Um, our conservation management plan is a plan that is very important. All of our partners, um, including County Executive and the Governor of New York will sign on to it um, and everybody has a say in um, trying their best to keep in line with management recommendations. Uh, it also allows some of our projects to be um, looked at for grant funded. 
We do our own funding of projects. We're funding some eelgrass right now. Uh, we're working with Southampton on the Riverside Redevelopment Project here in Flanders and looking at ways that they can maximize some of their um, potential wetland restoration uh, so that it can really become an active user, uh, passive user area. And we're really excited about that. Uh, and I wanted to know um, at this time, I guess, if anybody has any more questions about the work that we do. I open myself, my organization, to the trustees always. If you have questions about things put before you, um, we also act through our outreach team as scientific communicators. And we recognize that not everybody uh, is proficient in everything. And that sometimes, if we can guide or inform, that's what we're here to do. Thank you. Um, I do have one question. Yes. How long has the uh, fish passage been established in the Peconic River? So the Grandable Fishway Pass was put in, I want to say, about 10 years ago. Um, we are just going to contract one in Woodhull, and we're looking at one um, uh, upstream of that. And what is the uh, return run of the uh, juvenile fish? Do you? Uh... We haven't looked at the, this is the first year. So there have been some anecdotal um, numbers floating around. A gentleman at DEC for years has been over by Cranberry Bog, sort of taking numbers and measurements. This year was the first year that we were actually able to count. We had a graduate student from Stony Brook counting the numbers on the fish counter. So it was about 42,000 that were counted. So we're looking to have some of that information replicated um, and to see how we can continue this every year. You know, she was one grad student. Um, so we're really looking to expand that. We are involved, there is another program um, to do some culvert right sizing, which will also act um, as an alewife passage um, further east in Southampton. So we're working with Baykeeper and the town if we can get a fish counter in there also uh, is that, and what that looks like. Is that culvert uh, application, the one you're speaking about, is that in Ligony Brook in uh, South Harbor? Possibly, I don't know offhand. My question would be, what might there be that are volunteer opportunities or upcoming events or meetings that people in the audience might be I'll interested in? Mic. Okay, um, so we hold quarterly citizen advisory committee meetings that anyone uh, who wishes to can attend. These meetings get the public involved in what we do, and we talk about our citizen <coughs> science operations. We're currently working with some of our partners at SeaTuck Environmental, and with Group for the East End to do some monitoring and to expand our network for otters, for terrapin turtles, for the alewife counting. Uh, and we work very closely with Cornell Cooperative Extension and their program for horseshoe crabs. So anybody who's looking to get involved, we have a plethora of programs and every year we update what we do. So if you have a new idea or something that you think is important uh, to the natural environment on the East End, please let us know. If anybody from the audience has questions, we just need to ask for you to please come up to the podium if you have your question so it can be heard. I don't know if this is appropriate for her. Um, <coughs> please come to the mic so you can. Just have to identify yourself for record. Sorry. <coughs> I don't want to waste your time if this is an afternoon. Okay. Um, Joanne Long Merrill, um, president of the Baby Pine Civic and Taxpayers Association. Um, I just wanted to know about the scallops, the bay scallops, and if that would be your purview or that would be somebody else, and what's going on with them. I can answer that. Thank you. So, the Peconic Estuary Program <coughs> put together a task force um, when we first got news of the scallop die off. Uh, our program was born out of the brown tide and the scallop die-off in the late 80s and early 90s, so um, we took the news very hard and we wanted to mobilize quickly. Uh, and so what we've done is put a group of experts, we've brought them together to uh, filter through all of the known and unknown information. Uh, we've managed to be able to rule out certain things. Um, there was a, a thought process going around that there was too much oyster aquaculture that has been officially ruled out. There was some information going on that it was related to HABs, it is not. Um, and so we are 
currently convening again later this week, and we will do so bi-weekly until we can come up with a solution that all science partners are happy with um, and can give our results and recommendations um, to the public. I mean, I can just say that we are moving as swiftly as possible. Uh, Dr. Goldler at Stony Brook did give a presentation last uh, week also, where himself, uh, Brad Peterson, a seagrass exer expert, and Basim Alam, a, um, uh, a pathologist for shellfish, um, went through you know, what, they, what they were looking at. So we know that it is also the juvenile populations are doing well. So it appears to be something that affected the adult scallops, and so we're looking into that. Yeah, that was on CTV. I believe you could probably watch it. It was last Friday night. Brad Brunswick, I'm just curious, where do you get your funding? So our primary funding comes from the EPA under the National Estuary Program, uh, and that funding is matched equally by state and county governments. Thank you. Um, and we are always looking for a foundation and grant money, which we also apply for. Does anybody else have any questions? Thank you so much, Joyce. You're and welcome. Apologies Pleasure. for no projector. That's okay. <laughs> um, you can also go to our website. It is peconicestuary.org to uh, look at all of the information that we have there and get regular updates on our program activities and find out when our Citizens Advisory Committee meetings are, if you'd like more information or are interested. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. The next, the next discussion is uh, Gregor Vara Cornell Cooperative Extension. Good evening, everyone. I want to thank uh, Trustee Welker for inviting me here tonight. A quick note, I studied at Southern the College in 1982 with her father, Professor Raoul Welker, who had a big influence on me in my career. Just wanted to mention that. And it's, uh, it's really nice being here. I uh, first started with Cornell Cooperative Extension of Suffolk County in 1986. And I first came to a trustees meeting probably a year or two later with my boss at the time. Martin Lang was the supervisor. And I know that Edward Warner Sr. was on the trustees, if not the president of the trustees. And I've been working with the, the Southampton Town trustees really since then. Maybe the last 15 or so years, we've had a, a closer relationship with respect to uh, our contract with them to provide seed shellfish, including bay scallops oysters and hard clams. So that's been probably a 15 year, and I lose track of the years. Uh, you, we're talking, you know, tens of millions of, of seed shellfish uh, delivered. We actually go out with the, the bay constables and the maintenance guys and plant these. We did that uh, back in October this year. Uh, and we're going to try to do some more scallops next year for the trustees. Uh, I also work with a lot of commercial fishers, commercial uh, shellfish farmers, and all 10 towns in Suffolk County, and, and a few in Nassau, actually, that have shellfish, uh, I won't call them restoration programs, I'll call them uh, resource enhancement programs, where they put shellfish out, not to really restore population, but to enhance it and allow taxpayers, in most cases, to go and, and catch those shellfish when they mature, which could be anywhere from a year to three to five years, depending on the species we grow. Uh, I work from Manhattan to Montauk, and I'm looking uh, forward to working this coming year on a project possibly a stone's throw from here, uh, Goose Creek. It's at the end of Long Neck Boulevard, a, a spot that I visited a few years ago with uh, trustee-in-waiting, Eric Schultz, <laughs> sorry, mm -hmm. who uh, hopefully uh, you know, we'll get back with it. It never really happened, and we have to talk about what we can do there because it is close to shell fishing, and it maybe might need some, some uh, dredging to get some water flow in there. But it could be a great place for the towns uh, to have a nursery system to grow some stuff that we spawn, and I should mention that I'm headquartered in Southold at a county uh, facility. And the gentleman asked about funding earlier. You don't have to come up to the mic, I'll answer it. <laughs> the, the cooperative in Cornell Cooperative Extension is our funding source. It's cooperative among uh, federal, state, county, and local governments, as well as grants and contracts, as uh, Joyce said from, from the PEP. We are all, always looking for money. Uh, including from the trust, Board of Trustees and private foundations. And we've been pretty good at, uh, at getting grants and contracts for the last you know, 30, 33, 34 years that our program's been in existence. So we're part of Cornell Extension of Suffolk. 
you know the 4-H program. We run the farm in Yapang, <coughs> and of course our ag program works with potato farmers to, to grape growers and, you know, vineyard managers. Uh, that's probably about it, really. Can, can you just I had like an hour-long PowerPoint that we couldn't show. Aren't you lucky? <laughs> can you just talk about celebration so people know about it for next year? Yeah, uh, it was this past Saturday and Sunday. It takes place in the village of Greenport, where I happen to have a house. And it, uh, it's a thing where you buy a wristband for about $30, and it's a two-day event. You walk around to about 20 restaurants, all within walking distance, and you can buy a, uh, a taste of uh, shellfish. And there weren't very many bay scallops this year, obviously, for about 5 bucks, and a little uh, wine or beer that pairs with it for, for $3. So for about 10 bucks with a tip and tax, you, uh, you can walk around and spend about $200. <laughs> and, and it benefits our, our program, our SPAT program, which is the uh, Suffolk Project in Aquaculture Training. It's an oyster gardening program, which we will not be doing here in, in Goose Creek in that, uh, the Pine Neck Canal because it's closed to shell fishing and DEC doesn't like us putting uh, anything edible in closed waters, except Jamaica Bay. That's another thing we could talk about. <laughs> uh, I'm working with the city in Jamaica Bay with a lot of oysters, but that's, that's a different story. It also goes to our Back to the Bays initiative where we have outreach, everything from you know, paint, going to a restaurant and having a glass of wine and painting a scene. Maybe it could be a blowfish and people paint. And, um, it, it's, uh, it's a way that we have outreach to the community and also keep people employed because uh, I have to come up every year with about two-thirds of my salary and it used to be fully paid by the county. And it's actually made us a very uh, entrepreneurial program. So thanks for your tax dollars, but also, you know, we, we are uh, not complacent. Uh, celebration was a lot of fun. I was only there Saturday. Nice weather. Uh, yeah, 4 o'clock, the doors close, and then you hopefully will get a real meal at one of these restaurants, because it is a lot of work, and I think the, uh, the wait staff kind of get shortchanged with tips, and it's, it's kind of a mob scene. But it was fun. It'll be next, uh, probably first weekend in December again. Anything Greg, else? Can you touch on the uh, oyster spat program over in Tyana Bay? Oyster spat program. So you, this is the the state project. No, you're talking no about? I'm talking about with the Kim Tetrol and the uh, oh, and, and your ambassador the, uh, program. Yes, yes. So that's part of the spat program, right? So my colleague Kim started out in Southold with a community garden, like you'd have uh, tomatoes or peppers growing in a in a vacant lot or in a community garden on land. He started one in the water. Uh, using little cages that float and then people that were lucky enough to have a waterfront home in good water quality somewhere around Shelter Island, South Old, all the way up into like uh, Stony Brook area they grow at their dock, it's a little different he gives a class every month and he started a thing in Tiana uh, back, I don't know, five years ago, more six years ago six years ago so it's right where the, uh, the pavilion is and we have a, a presence there now thanks to the, the town south uh, Southampton and, and the trustees and it's been a great program people grow their own oysters they can't sell them or barter them they can eat them give them away or plant them in the environment and some people do all three so it's, it's been a great program it started in 2000 so it's and it's uh, almost 20 years old next year yeah, it's a it's a great program for yeah. you know public education and outreach I want to thank you guys yeah well again thank you for your support any other questions Thank you, Thank you so you, much, Greg. Greg. All right, that wraps it up for the uh, discussions. Uh, Joe, we have a public hearing, I believe, scheduled. Would you like we, to explain? Yeah. Explain. Okay. Okay. Okay, at our last meeting, which was uh, December 2nd, the board under section 47J of the uh, blue book called for a public hearing on this application regarding 101 Dune Road and East Quag. Uh, in conversations with council, it was raised by her that the uh, actual time for the notice of the public hearing was short. And I pointed out to her that Section 47J, Subdivision 4, says the Board of Trustees on its own motion or at the request of the applicant may modify or extend any of the aforementioned time periods for good cause. Uh, yeah, we were a little bit short on the 10-day notice, which is required. However, under the circumstances, 
you have the authority to call for the public hearing. It was requested by them that perhaps we could dispense with the public hearing and take testimony in, in an informal manner, if you will. Her concern was primarily jurisdictional in case there was litigation. Uh, the Blue Book does not require you to hold a public hearing. Uh, we do not need to in order to entertain the application. However, they did post the notice for the public hearing. They made service of that notice. The Blue Book requires that the service be made by certified mail return receipt. They did it by FedEx and overnight delivery. So there was adequate notice given. Respectfully, while I think that we do still have that authority under subdivision four, again, there's nothing wrong with holding and in holding a discussion on this and taking the testimony from the public without it being deemed formally a public hearing. So as such, I would ask the board to dispense with the public hearing formally and begin to take uh, the information from the applicant and from the, uh, the people who wish to speak for or against the application. Okay. So I'd like to make a motion to dispense of that. I'll second it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We're, we're trying to expedite an application that's before us, uh, Round Dune, Inc., 101 Dune Road, East Quag. There's uh, been severe erosion around the, the uh, two uh, southerly buildings. We're been pre we have been presented with uh, much information from uh, Aaron Chichunian, First Coastal. He's a consultant of record. Um, so I'd like, uh, you know, anybody that would like to uh, speak at this our meeting can come up. Please state your name and uh, information. Uh, Aaron, would you like to start off maybe with a little overview for the public's? Thank you, Mr. Mortar. Uh, members of the board, my name is Aaron Tertunian, First Coastal Corporation, West Hampton Beach, New York, on behalf of the applicant. Uh, I want to thank uh, Mr. Lombardo uh, for uh, his uh, coordination on uh, making sure that this board had uh, proper jurisdiction. And I'd, li I'd like to thank uh, the, the board for expediting our review in this uh, uh, very dire situation. Um, I've, these are photographs that I took this morning at approximately 10.30 uh, of the round dune. And uh, you can see that the uh, emergency uh, uh, measures that were actually approved by this board and the DEC and the town, um, uh, w w which were in place, have failed. Uh, you can see that even the uh, small storm that went through last night has overwashed these 80-pound uh, sandbags and that the foundations of the buildings uh, remain exposed and vulnerable to flooding and erosion. I, I won't go uh, into the details of, uh, of uh, the imperiled state of the buildings. The board heard uh, significant testimony at their last meeting uh, from uh, Mr. Mike Benacasa, the chief building inspector, from myself, from Paul Delandro, professional engineer, and from Seth Allen, uh, all of which uh, I believe adequately uh, describe the situation. I'll just uh, leave, uh, summarize that by saying the situation is getting worse um, and that uh, there is no uh, recovery in sight that would change the trajectory towards uh, imperilment. Uh, the plan that we've put forth, I will show you. plan that we're proposing is an emergency measure consisting of what are called geo cubes. These are three foot by three foot by three foot geosynthetic containers. They are filled with sand that we truck in from an upland source. Uh, then they are placed um, in a row too deep and stacked four high and they're interconnected and this is an important aspect of how the uh, this protective work functions because it's not just a series of, in, of isolated bags. Each one of these cubes is interconnected with the, the other, and that is what gives it the strength to withstand, at least over the short term, uh, the strength of the ocean. This is not a permanent fix by any means. This is merely an emergency measure in order to uh, preserve these structures. Um, as this board is well aware, there is a large beach <coughs> restoration program that is 100% federally funded uh, that is currently in Washington called the Fire Island to Montauk Point Project. And that project is scheduled for construction in 2021. 
I have it on very good authority that things are, are moving on pace and uh, I think that with the support of this board, the support of the community and, and the support of our, our federal um, elected representatives that we can bring that project in and, uh, and uh, provide the type of nature-based long-term relief that this barrier island system sorely needs. Uh, with that, I believe my uh, colleague Karen Hogue, if you have uh, something I have to say. Two quick questions. Absolutely. At the last meeting we left off, you were in the process of uh, applying and hopefully receiving a DEC permit. Has that been uh, granted to you? Yes. Well, I uh, thank you for bringing that up. Uh, there are two other entities that have uh, regulatory jurisdiction: the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation and the Southampton Town Coastal Erosion. Uh, both of those permits have been received and uh, they have been uh, submitted uh, to the board and uh, I believe are in your board packet. I do have hard copies here if you need any. Um, but uh, those were uh, all issued and uh, both of them have significant conditions and those conditions, if you read them, will, you will find that they're very similar to the conditions that this board required in 1997 when they uh, authorized a, a, a geotube um, at this particular location. We also have uh, letters from both adjoining property owners who have submitted letters of support to the board. I believe those are in your package as well. Thank you. Now the uh, fill that's in the, uh, the geotubes, not only is it from an upland source, it's also beach compatible fill? Yeah, it's all clean sand, beach compatible fill from an upland source. And altogether, it's about 2,500 cubic yards of sand. And that will go both in the cubes and over the cubes to cover them. Good evening, members of the board, and thank you very much for allowing us to proceed this evening. My name is Karen Hogue. I'm with the law firm of Toomey Latham. On behalf of the applicant, I just wanted to clarify a statement that was made at our last meeting on December 2nd. There was a question posed as to whose fault it was that the pilings underneath the structure are deteriorating. And I think the question was proposed to Paul Delandro of Delandro Andrews uh, Engineering. And until the piles were recently exposed, there was no way of knowing what the conditions of them were. They were covered by sand prior to this event, so there was no indication that there was any de deterioration, there was no sway of the building, no cracks in the walls, so it was something that we discovered when this issue um, came to light. So th thank you for listening to us, and I'm sure there's some members of the public who are here to speak. I have a, I have a question for Mr. Kachuba. I have a two questions basically uh, one what happens if the federal government doesn't proceed with FIMP what are your plans then what are your what are you, what's your fallback basically uh, well the fallback in that uh, situation it would be um, the, that the Tiana erosion control district would be uh, is an entity that is able to proceed forward with beach restoration similar to what's been done in Sagaponic and and Bridgehampton okay and second related to what Ms. Hogue brought up in terms of the pilings, will there be any uh, improvement in the piling situation since you now are aware of these structural problems with them? Well, um, some of the problems we can't uh, address because they're, the, the materials themselves have degraded. Uh, but uh, two things, uh, number one, by getting sand around them and higher up, it will provide stability. And to the extent that further investigation shows that there is remediation that we can undertake, we will do it. Thank you. I got one question. What are you doing with the structure in the middle of nowhere? That structure, uh, thank you, that structure is being removed and relocated landward of the dune. When's it going to be removed? Uh, during during the, the, the installation process when, you know, right now, uh, as you can see, there's uh, a pretty good low tide beach, not much of a high tide beach. So we just have to make sure we have safe working conditions to get there and, and, and get it done. At this time, is there anybody else that would like to address the board uh, on this uh, Round Dune, Inc. 101 Dune Road application? Yes. Yeah, come on. <clears throat> Good evening. I'm Andrew Serenzioni, and um, I have a house on 206 Dune Road in Quag. That's roughly halfway between Round Dune and the village of Quag Beach. Um, up to this 
this point, the town of Southampton and you know, the trustees have not approved any hardened structures on the, on the beach. Uh, there's a big decision coming up now that we're going to have to live with for a long time. Uh, when you allow, I, the way I see it, when you allow it the first time, even though this may be a temporary thing, uh, it's going to be hard to deny people in the future if they, if they want to put hard instructions up. I live in Quag, and I don't know if you've seen what the Quag Beach looks like, wall-to-wall hardened -wall structures. Um, so that's a, that's a big decision. As far as round doing at this point, um, when I look at it, I mean, I walk up and down the beach a lot, and it's very hard to walk there now at all on uh, low tide, even much less high tide. And, uh, I see with hard instructions it's going to be even worse. And, and I, I have sympathy for the people around Dune and all of Southampton, including myself, who live on the beach. But uh, I don't see this as a solution. I see is that these, these structures kill our beach. Hard instructions are put in there to protect the houses, not the beach. So we have to consider all of the people of Southampton who use the beach. Uh, right now, Quag does not have a beach. Even on low tide, you can't walk past. And I have some pictures, though. I'll show you in a minute of that. When I when I look at Randu and I see to the east, I see a pretty good amount of sand. And to the west, it's really eaten in. So and to me, in, in essence, the, the work that's been done over the years, the soft structures, the sand, the, the sandbags and whatever uh, have actually acted like a hell of hardened structures, deflected the sand out. And we may say it's only a couple hundred yards, but what's going to happen when you put geo cubes there and the house next to it gets cut in and they want to put geo cubes in? How are you going to say no to them when they do it? Now, I know this is supposed to be a, a temporary thing, but Temporary doesn't always work out. I heard in Quag do some of these geo tubes that two and geo cubes they put in was supposed to be temporary. I don't know if that's true or not, but they're still there. There's nothing temporary. It's going to be hard to tell someone if they're, and especially around them, it's going to be hard to tell them to take them out if their problems still exist down the line. And there's no guarantee about the Army Corps of Engineers. I mean, there's been talk that they're. They're going to get out of the business of doing this in a few more years. I've heard this talk. I don't know as far as the amount of sand, even if they're not out of the business. I see uh, West Hampton Dunes that they're they're pumping sand there right now. Again, I think for like the seventh time, I think this is. Is that right, Aaron? I don't know about the seventh time, I think. And I believe they run out of sand. I see their dredge right in front of my house in Quad, taking the sand, bringing it down to West Hampton. From what I understand, correct me if I'm wrong. So, anyway, okay, so one more thing. Shinnecock Inlet, we know what the problem is there. And you see how the sand is built up on the west side, on the east side, and how it's deficient on the west side, creating all these problems. This is what we have around them. This is also what we have, excuse me, <laughs> this is also what we have in Quag. Uh, these are pictures of Quag. I don't know if I can do this. This is what we have in Quag. And these are geo tubes, which I know we're not talking about geo tubes here. But you can see how they've eaten out around. This is the village. This is the village beach down here. Can you see that? Can I put this on your easel here, Aaron? This, this here is, where am I, this is the house up here, okay, and this is looking west, okay, this is around the side, when you come around, look what it's done to this house, this swimming pool is about ready to fall in the ocean, these geos cubes which were installed this last year are collapsing, yeah, look at them, they're all falling down. 
because the water wraps around the corner here, digs in. This house, which is way back here, is in dire straits. So it's coming from this way when it, well, it comes from the east. When it comes from the south, it's coming in this way. Look at, look at the house. This is way back. This is what the beach looks like. What a disaster. And uh, I just caution that uh, I don't want to see all of East Quad looking this way, too. And it could. You have the one, I mean, I know there's a problem with the people that have the house there. I mean, what do you say to them? But there's been a problem for years that hasn't been addressed, as you know. The problem's now emergency because they're ready to fall into the ocean. But I don't think putting structures in front of it is going to save it save temporary but it could create more long-term problems no beach but bulkheaded all along that's all i could say okay. thank you for listening thank you. <coughs> I, I just want a little response to that we didn't permit any of those structures in that area in quark in quark because we lost our regulatory authority I know, in a I court know, case, I know, you know, I live, I live and, and we fought long and hard on a couple of the, actually three of the properties, that uh, had geotubes put in there without our per, any permission or knowledge, and yeah. by the time we realized they were there, uh, uh, the judge deemed that the properties were of such value that they were allowed to keep those uh, structures. This is what, what I said when I first when I first started talking. To you, you, you've never allowed this in the town of Southampton. You know, Bill Jaquag is even though it's in Southampton, they have their own rules, and this is the mess that they created there. I hate to say it. There's a, the, 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 it starts on the farthest, I'm glad you brought that up, because the house to, to the, the, where the first geo tubes installed was in the 1990s at uh, 188, and that's the one I showed you on the picture here, and everything to the west of that is created this little by little. It's kind of like mushrooms and, and there are probably eight or ten uh, geo cubes that were temporarily installed in Psychoponic and Bridgehampton after Sandy which are still there they're covered by a dune and they don't have any of those issues so this is a thing that we're gonna have to weigh as far as how much sand how often yeah. the replenishment yeah. if it goes forward and that's temporarily and how temporary is that going to be? You know, that's going to be there forever. I think it's exactly going to be a hard time. In, in 1985, I think it is, there was a newspaper article, South Anthem Press. Mayor Moats at the time in Quag wrote that he was sorry they gave the okay to put the geotubes at 188 because he was afraid, uh, afraid to ask to have them taken out, afraid of lawsuit. It's right there, the last chapter of the newspaper article in 85. And I have that if you want to copy it. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to address the board? Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, trustees, for everything that you do and for taking uh, the time uh, to hear this application as well as, in general, all global applications and protecting uh, beach access and the shoreline. I'd like to thank you for that. My name is uh, Robin Eshapur. Uh, I'm a property owner on Dune Road, and as well, I am a committee member of the Tiana Beach Erosion Control District. The Tiana Beach uh, Erosion Con Control District did not have the time to put forth a formal vote and resolution but it is the consensus of the committee uh, that we would like to support our neighbor, the Round Dune, and uh, we would not like to see their structure fall into the sand, into the ocean. Uh, I'm going to speak now personally. As a neighbor, I want as many options to me as possible in the event that there is a similar situation in front of my house, in front of my property. Uh, my consultant, the ECD's consultant, is Mr. Tartusian. Uh, we have followed his guidance and advice, and uh, 
he's advising this project uh, uh, based on that. Uh, and what I have heard is that, the, that these geotubes, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, there's permitting to be obtained from the town, there's permitting to be obtained from DEC. I understand that the town wants to collect a bond and they want to present, put a, a time limit on how long, uh, six months with a reasonable extension. To me, that sounds very reasonable. <coughs> Uh, you put the geotubes in, you help these folks uh, protect their property, you keep an eye on it, and when they need to be pulled out, if they don't pull it out, the town has a bond, they go in and they pull it out. It's very different than what this gentleman is describing is going on in Quag. I don't know what they do in Quag, but the due diligence that I've done it, this seems to be a very rational way to, 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 to move forward, is to allow them the benefit of protecting their property. And it's, there's not many options that are available to us. This seems to be uh, a, an option, and it's not an option like a seawall that's built in. This is something that could be removed. Uh, there's no question that the right thing to do is to allow them to save their structure, allow this structure not to collapse, and over the next several months, figure out what it takes, what the, what the more long-term answer is, but they have an emergency. And I would like you to act positively on that emergency, and I would like them to be able to work out a plan long term, uh, getting to FIMP. As I mentioned, I'm on the committee of the Erosion Control District. I do believe that FIMP is going to, the Fire Island to Montauk Point is going to happen. Uh, we've been working with the Army Corps through. Uh, the, uh, uh, through land management, through Marty Shea's office. Uh, we do believe that FIMP is going to happen, and we do believe that FIMP, is it a forever fix? No, but it is a, it seems to be working in West Hampton Dunes, it seems to be working in Sagapont. By the way, I'm a surf cast fisherman, I drive up and down the beach all fall. It does appear to be working in Sagapani and Bridgehampton. It definitely appears to be working in West Hampton Dunes. So let's let these guys save their building. Let the Tyana Erosion Control District do whatever it's got to do to stay on top of the Army Corps to get them, and let everyone live happily ever after. You know, I'd like to look at the pot. I'm, I'm a guy that looks at the glass half full. Not, a, not empty. The geotubes are not, cubes are not the perfect answer, but they are what's available. I haven't heard or seen anything that's, that's available that is better. So for that, I would like you to highly consider approving this application for my neighbor is the round doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Is there anybody else? Uh, please come to the podium. I'm Michael Cates. I'm the president of Brown Dune. And I, I do land use work as an attorney, and I appreciate your role, your expertise, uh, particularly in an area of expert knowledge. And so we're with you in the sense that we are willing to listen and to comply with your requests. I want to emphasize two things. First. We're in a state of crisis. Um, we have a number of people here. I, I would just ask uh, the residents of Round Dune who are here, if you could just stand so that they can see uh, who you are. Um, thank you. Uh, we're here out of a certain sense of desperation. But we are coming here with two things in place. We have assessed ourselves $400,000 
to build this project, to protect our buildings and our beach. Uh, we're halfway through that assessment, and we'll have the balance of it by the end of February. So we're ready to move on that. We're not seeking public funding. This is a privately financed effort. Secondly, um, you heard reference to the conditions that not only were recently imposed by the town, but by this Board of Trustees in 1996. We're, we're willing to accept all of those conditions. Um, one of them that I think is most important is the protocol for future reporting and management. We are, we are required by you to monitor the condition of those cubes to make sure that we are not, I, I call it leaching, but it's bleeding or forcing the sand to the adverse consequences of our neighbors, and we're prepared to monitor that and report to you with Aram's help on a continuing basis. We um, very much uh, agree that this is a response to an emergency. We are not asking you to declare a matter of policy that has any bearing in the long term in terms of whether these uh, cubes will be hardened structures of permanency. We just see it as an emergency need uh, which Aram, uh, uh, which our consultants are telling us is the only choice that we have. And as, as it was said to you before, we want to save the patient until we find the cure. That's really what it's all about. Uh, with that, I just wanted to read, have read to you one of the letters of one of our owners who has a history at Round Dune, uh, who can inform you a little bit more about what we are and uh, what we uh, hope to do or have done. So Susan, one of my board members, uh, Susan, Amster, if you could come forward. Uh, I have it in writing if you, you don't. Oh, sure. Yeah. If she could just read to you Annette Green's letter. Sure. I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for allowing us this time. Dear Southampton Town Trustees, as a 40-year resident of the East Quab Co-op, Round Dune, and former president of the board, it is with a heavy heart that I face the unprecedented damage the property sustained during the storm which impacted so many of us. Round Dune has always been an excellent and concerned neighbor and tenant owners. Tenant owners have participated on a regular basis in helping to resolve problems which have occurred on the South Shore over the years, i.e. preserving and maintaining the integrity of Dune Road. We are also dedicated to maintaining our property and the four iconic buildings at the highest level. We are major supporters of local businesses. I share with my co-op co-tenant owners, the realization that the barrier island on which Round Dune is located, as well as many, many private homes, act as a protection for inland properties and residences. This is a responsibility we do not take lightly. Round Dune is family-centered, devoted to the well-being of its children and seniors senior citizens, such as myself. Now at 95, I have a heightened appreciation of the bounty and beauty provided by beachside living, which we all treasure. This does not preclude our awareness of the challenges of nature, which we have dealt with over all these years. We urgently request that every consideration be given to the protection of Round Dune and surrounding property to ensure its survival, as well, of course, that of the Barrier Island itself, its homes, businesses, and beaches in the immediate, in the immediate future and for years to come. Your consideration and decisions in this matter, which will impact on the lives of many hundreds of residents and visitors, are deeply appreciated. Cordially, Annette Green, and thank you. And because of her age, it was a little difficult for her to make the trip back with us tonight. But she does 
make that trip to Randoon on a very regular basis. Thank you. Lisa, can you thank you. for the record? Yes, yes I need that, please. Can, can you please grab that, please? Sure. We want to enter it into the record. Oh, no. We'll, we'll get it to you. <coughs> okay. I think there's other There's other people. Yeah, I don't know. That's not, I don't think it's all by itself. Yeah, yeah no. I'll get it to you, Mr. Lawyer. Okay, thank you. Is there anybody else that would like, ma'am, can you please come up? My name is Karen Serencioni, I'm Andrew's wife. I live at 206 Dune Road in Hog, and um, I, I sincerely sympathize with the Round Dune residents. I walk there almost daily <laughs> and gotten soaking wet, you know, doing so, and I understand <laughs> exactly what you're going through, but I'm very conflicted because I'm a reader and I've read um, the three experts in the field that I ascribe to. Um, Oren Pilkey, who's the um, Duke Emeritus Professor of Duke University, just published this book, Sea Level Rise on American Shores. And in this book, one of the first sentences that he says in the beginning there's just three points I want to make. I won't go on and on, but of why I'm so conflicted. And um, you know, I ask you to listen to what I'm saying. I understand your plight and that it is a dire emergency. But I'm also concerned with these um, consequences of geotubes that I don't think geocubes, they're all called hardened structures. So sometimes I interchange geocubes with geotubes, but I know you're talking about geo cubes here. So this is the sentence. Sea walls, he calls them sea walls, but they're all hardened structures. In the beginning, he clarifies that. On an eroding shoreline, always destroy the beach. Beach loss occurs because the seawall does not address the forces causing the erosion. So the beach continues narrowing until it's lost altogether. Oh, that's of course over time. I know that you're planning just to have this temporarily, but um, the other two parts of this that all these experts talk about, Rob, Dr. Robert Young, um, Dr. Oren Pilkey was Robert Young's mentor, and right now Dr. Robert Young is a college professor, and he's a professional geologist, and he's also the head of the program for shoreline development programs, coastal development programs. Yeah. And Jay Tansky in the Sea Grant report is also a specialist in coastal processes. And all three of these experts in this field concur that there's three major, major problems with hardened structures on the beach. And I, I just mentioned one, that it doesn't address the problems with erosion. The other big one is that when we just had these three northeasters in Quag, I mean, well, I guess they were all over, three in a row. And then it rained, too, after that several times. And what happens is the beach, and I actually, actually almost saw it happen, the ocean surge wants to come up and migrate landward. But because we have a wall of geo cubes or geo tubes or hardened structures, it can't migrate landward. So it it has to protect the property at which it fronts, which it does some of the time successfully until years later when they start to crumble. But probably in the beginning, they it does protect the property in front of it. But then, as you saw with the photo that my husband showed. It, it has that shotgun effect to the west usually, but sometimes the east. It could be both depending on the tides. And um, it can devastate adjacent properties. And I know you said you're gonna watch out for that and make sure that that's not happening. So that's the, the big effect of it. The other effect is that, that the, there's like a, a natural sediment um, transport of sand, and often a hardened structure, a wall of, of hardened structure, will stop that natural transport that would replenish the beach. So it's just something to consider that 
this is why Orrin Pilkey wrote that we're going to destroy the beach because it's not going to get the natural sediment transport from the erosion, natural erosion of the dune. It's going to block that natural sand coming to the beach and it's going to block the other the sand, sand transport from the wet from the east to the west so those are the effects of geocubes that I'm a little concerned about that it will destroy the beach and you know it's 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 things that I've read about but it's also things that I see as I walk on the beach because I see these houses since um this is the picture of the one in 2005 in Quag, where you can't, it, it goes so far out into the sea that, you know, you can't walk there, so it, it takes up, you know, the footage of the beach. So anyway, it's just, these are just points to consider um, when you start to do this. If it's not really going to solve the problem and you're going to take it out in six months, I, I mean, I vote for the sand bypass at the Shinnecock Inlet. I know that's a long-term project. It's not immediate, and you have an immediate situation. But I don't know what um, geocubes are going to do in six months. You know, are they going to help those dunes that are over the edge, or the, the condos, I mean, over the edge? I don't, I don't really know if, that would, if they're taken out in six months. I don't know, it doesn't seem like um, it's the best situation. Anyway, does anyone have any questions? Okay. I, I can add a little bit to you what you presented. Uh, Friday, I, I made a conference call myself and our attorney Joe Lombardo to uh, Robert Young. He was in Norway doing business over there. Um, and uh, we asked him multiple questions. He wasn't able to come up here and look at the beach, but he has been at the beach after Sandy, and he's walked basically from, you know, Sagaponic all the way to the village of Quag, and in the in inner embayments, and he's got a good idea of what's going on there. Um, actually, on my desk in town hall today, there was a proposal to hire him as a with a retainer. Oh, oh great! So we're in the process of. Uh, I'm um, I'm the president of the trustees, so I have to give it to the rest of the board members for them to look at. But I think it would be a really good idea for us, you know, doing our due diligence to have someone of his caliber to look at this on a bigger scale, a long-term scale. We're, we're here looking at a very short term, like a second in time or a fraction of a second in time, just to do something to, you know, make sure that they don't, the buildings don't fall into the ocean and then a longer term plan which is you know a generational thing that's going to hopefully come out of this is is where we're headed yes like maybe even considering retreat well yeah <laughs> but that's good because if you read the southampton press um article that he you know he was interviewed for he, he has all those points in it that that's great but if you look at the ocean there's no beach there now, right? And there's nothing, no geotubes there now. Yeah. So, I, I think it's gives them six months to figure out what they're going to do and how they're going to do it. If we don't do anything, that structure's going to be in the ocean. Yeah. And that probably won't be the only one. Yeah. Unfortunately, this fall, the erosion that has taken place there is unprecedented because the storms that we have had aren't extremely bad northeasters there. They're like on a, on a one to ten, they're probably like a two or a three. But that sun deck was in the dune in September. So look what happened. Was it 60 or 70 feet of dune that's completely gone there? So I think we're looking for a temporary solution that we can build on for a long term plan. Yes. I think we're clearly under assault by the North Atlantic. I mean, it's, it's obvious. Maybe it wasn't completely the storms it was like the Shinnecock Inlet it was long neglected so it well that's the that's the thing is yeah. that we we are in need of a major beach renourishment we're clearly under assault you got a lot of activity going on just west of the Shinnecock Inlet to protect all that infrastructure there that we have and I think every elected official should be standing shoulder to shoulder working hard to make sure that the Fire Island Montauk plan <coughs> happens because we need beach nourishment. There are beach nourishment projects going on up and down the entire eastern seaboard. We're not the only ones that are having these problems. 
but it's long overdue. Maybe the sand bypass system is something that has to be uh, looked at again as well. But the like trustee Stafford pointed out, you have no geotubes or geocubes in this area right now. It's being decimated along with a lot of other areas. Um, we need our beach. We fight hard to maintain this beach for public access. And I think that it's, if there's a time where we have to try and get this major beach nourishment plan for our community, it has to be now. We should all be working hard to support, make sure at the federal level they understand, and I think they do at this point. And um, we don't have a lot of options here right now. Yeah, but no to that beach nourishment is a temporary. It could, the sand could have been washed out in, in the northeast. It's a, you know something well, necessary at some times, but the bypass at the inlet, the inlet could be something permanent. It's going to have to be something that's heavily engineered. I believe it's being discussed at a much higher level. Um, this is much greater beyond. I mean, we fight tooth and nail to defend the public access and work with everybody the best that we possibly can. Yeah, the state has a stake here. The town has a stake here. But we all have to work together. We're battling Mother Nature. This is a tough battle, okay? We don't have a lot of time. I was down at Round Dune earlier today. I took a look at the structures. Uh, this is a serious crisis. It is an emergency. Um, we're all gonna, just going to do the best we can. You bring up a lot of very good points. Um, we've talked about these. Trustees have consulted with Dr. Young. Um, we're doing the best we can in a very bad situation here. I okay? understand that. The views that you want. Thank you. But Thank I think you. Mother Nature is changing a little bit, a little bit more forceful. We were going to put a resolution on to open up SAG to drain it. Didn't have to. Mother Nature opened it up last night. Hmm. There's so much water, it broke right through. Yeah. yeah. Which was good for us. Yeah. But, you right. know, it just shows you at any given time, she's in charge. Right. That's right. Like I thought it was going to take out the fishing docks, but. Just, Let's go. I, I thought it was. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Kevin, would you like to address this, please? <coughs> Good evening, board. Uh, my name is Kevin McAllister. I'm president of Defend H2O. Um, I had shared my credentials at the last meeting. I hold a Master's of Science in Coastal Zone Management. Um, much of that uh, graduate work was in coastal processes, all the sciences associated with it, as well as uh, shoreline management. Um, my tenure in Florida in various roles, uh, roughly 12 years with Palm Beach County, uh, much of that time was in shoreline protection. Um, I've been involved in uh, writing regulations, um, restoration projects, uh, the monitoring, uh, so my breadth of experience in the subject is, is uh, very deep. Um, with respect to known impacts, and I, I won't spend a lot of time on that, um, I, obviously I'm hearing Dr. Novak speak about no net increase in shoreline hardening in the Peconics is uh, certainly a worthy goal. Uh, obviously uh, front and center is the loss of public access, certainly on an ocean beach. Um, you know, I'd like to speak to the geotextile sand containers, and, and let's be absolutely clear. Uh, at times, uh, we utilize reinforced dune. I've, I've heard dune uh, represented uh, uh, at the prior meeting as part of this project. Uh, this is not a dune. Uh, this is a structure. Uh, New York State Coastal Regulations, uh, geotextile sand containers are classified as shoreline hardening. Uh, for the impacts. Um, ultimately, over time, you know, the concern with the trends, and you, you heard and saw the photographs, very graphic with respect to quag, and I know quag very well uh, from having resided there. Um, you know, the incremental change over time, and, and honestly, that was um, eye-opening to see the structures uh, basically linked together from one property to the next. But ultimately, that is the trend. Uh, you have an end scour effect uh, at the ends of the structure itself. Um, obviously, when I, I spoke to the board last, you know, the structure has to be in play with energy. And then over time, we will incrementally lose that fronting beach, that public access, uh, and have uh, downdraft implications, forcing the neighbor to follow suit with another structure. So again, over time, the trend is hardening. A loss of the public beaches. 
Um, we've heard about sand pumping in, in the Army Corps plan. Uh, having worked in Florida, uh, I've seen the good, bad, and ugly with respect to sand replenishment. Um, we're waiting on the Army Corps. That's been in the works for quite a few years. Um, you've heard me talk about sand bypassing. That has not happened at Shinnecock Inlet, and I'll be perfectly clear on that. Uh, the navigational dredging that we see periodically uh, is not active sand bypassing. Uh, Fifteen years ago, there was a proposal to establish a sand bypassing system in some form. Uh, ultimately, that was uh, not supported. Um, it was the Department of State wanted to fund it. Uh, they asked Suffolk County to manage it, uh, maintain it. Uh, there was opposition on the Southampton side, and ultimately that proposal was withdrawn. Uh, so 15 years later, we're still talking about sand bypassing. Uh, the Army Corps has included it in its con conceptual plan for FIM. So what, is, what exactly does that mean? Are we talking about a, a pump house uh, installed on the western side, a roving dredge? Uh, the bottom line is we have to maintain uh, so activity where we at least keep some semblance of what is lost to the system on the downdrift side. Uh, the average lifespan for the mid-Atlantic region of Norwich beaches is three to four years. So again, uh, experience in Florida, I've seen uh, a mile and a half long project uh, disappear in a year and a half because of uh, uh, non-compatible beach sediments. And we can uh, certainly subscribe that we have compatible sediments. That remains to be seen. Uh, but my argument is that ultimately with the uh, Army Corps project, their ability to uh, respond, um, I'll say emergency response, to erosion hotspots downdrift from the inlet, it's going to be more and more difficult. Uh, they are pulling, pulled, uh, you know, running thin in up and down the East Coast. They are in high demand. I shared with you uh, two years ago when the Corps uh, did a uh, presentation throughout the South Shore uh, pertaining to FIMP. Uh, in Southampton at the uh, college, they acknowledged uh, basically at 30 years uh, they were looking to get out of sand replenishment that uh, this should fall on uh, basically the obligation or responsibility of local government or these private erosion control districts. So my, my point is there's a real gamble as to how um, wide and how consistent we can maintain a beach there. My concern with the geotextiles, while they're being uh, suggested that this is a, a temporary um, solution, uh, emergency response, and I can appreciate that, but over time, if in fact we do not have a <coughs> substantial beach in that area or we pump a beach and it disappears quickly, uh, the likelihood of having these structures, this structure removed, is going to be difficult. And I will tell you, it can easily happen where these morph into either steel or stone, uh, more permanent um, structures. Um, going down this road uh, is a slippery slope. Um, I know the trustees have uh, done a good job in uh, trying to protect the integrity of uh, ocean beaches and, and basically a prohibition of the structures. Uh, but this is going to get more and more difficult. So I urge you, if, if there's any consideration to this, that it is, in fact, um, on a uh, basically a, a date certain uh, temporary basis, and that there be a performance bond in some form applied where uh, if these are not, in fact, removed, that uh, the trustees have the ability, uh, by virtue of having funding, uh, to execute their removal um, you know, in, uh, as part of any permit. And uh, the last thing I'll say, and uh, not to get into long term, but we have to talk about long term through this strand. Um, we've seen level, uh, a rise in sea level over the last 40 years of approximately four inches. Uh, New York State regulations uh, identify between 11 and 30 inches for the next 40 years. So that's substantial. Um, you know, the old adage, we ain't seen nothing yet, and we really haven't. So again, back to the ability to respond and pumping sand and having regularity is going to get more and more difficult. Um, Long-term vision in this area with a dynamic barrier island where wetlands are migrating, 
um, certainly to the south, and you, you see it everywhere. Um, you know, the road is underwater every new and full moon, practically. Uh, you know, what is the long term here? Uh, are we talking about uh, major engineering works? And that will mean literally armoring uh, certainly the backside and backfilling to raise elevations. And we haven't even touched on water quality impacts from uh, the myriad of septics that are out there that it will, if not already, be in water. So I think you have to consider the long term. I <laughs> urge this board with other government, um, the town board, Suffolk County legislature, state of New York, we've got to have start having dialogue about what the long term prospect here is. So again, um, with respect to the project um, and you know the need to fortify and protect uh, for the winter storm months, uh, you know I, the board's uh, wisdom will will guide us. But I urge you ensure that this is uh, short term because again it can easily uh, turn into memorialization in an, another form where you know back to quag um, you know that could very well turn into sheet steel sheet pile. We're talking true permanence uh, by virtue of not having adequate sand in the system. Uh, and again, a, a viable beach. And, and you know my feelings on coastal retreat. Uh, there are probably a handful of areas uh, in Suffolk County. Uh, this is one of them where I think we have to minimize uh, development, uh, acquisition, condemnation over time if necessary. Uh, but with lead. Um, ultimately, if we are serious as the trustees' charge is to protect water quality in Shinnecock Bay, this has to remain a, a viable natural dynamic system. Uh, engineering works will have uh, ramifications long term for water quality in Shinnecock. Thank you for your interest. In Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Yes, Mayor. My name is Ellen Cohn, and I'm a 25-year resident at Round Dune. I am also the treasurer of our board. We at Round Dune very much understand the responsibilities of the trustees and appreciate all of your expertise. But I would also like to address our neighbors and friends who are sitting in the audience as well. We are 72 families. We are asking you to understand and put yourself in our position. We now need a Band-Aid. The child is very sick. We understand your responsibilities and the other organizations that have already given us permits. We have both of our other permits. It is only up to you now. We will post the performance bond. We are asking for all of your help now in helping us solve this and we will agree to whatever is requested of us, but we need to go forward now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hello. Um, my name is Courtney Garneau. I am the um, representing the Eastern Long Island chapter for Surfrider. Surfrider is a national foundation that's 35 years old. Um, Surfrider's mission includes protecting the public beaches and public access. Southampton Town Trustees mission includes protecting the town's beaches. Our coasts are dynamic and constantly changing, slowly migrating year to year. As has been well documented, hard structures result in the eventual loss of beach and ultimately the properties that are at risk. There are important conditions that must be considered in issuing this permit. What is the duration for the proposed geotubes? Who will maintain and monitor these structures? And who will remove them in April when the sand begins to shift back with southwest winds and swell direction? Who is going to bear those costs? As we have seen in one talk, East Hampton Town was told by the Army Corps of Engineers to anticipate $150,000 maintenance costs for a similar project yearly. The costs annually for the past three years have been nearly $1 million paid for by the East Hampton town tax taxpayers. A third component of this permit moving forward should have a feasibility assessment 
proposing a sustainable relocation of the structure. There are many eyes on this project and the outcome of this permit process. We need to be innovative with long-term solutions and not Band-Aids. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to address the board? Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Tom Narrow. I'm from Hampton Bays, and I, too, uh, have worked with the Surfrider Foundation now for over 20 years. Um, and uh, I've been involved in a lot of uh, coastal projects and, and watching ill-conceived shore hardening structures happen. Um, so much of what needs to happen is common sense. Um, the barrier islands, as everybody has said, they move, they change. Um, there will always be a beach. The only thing that's going to stop that is a shore hardening structure. Um, you know, I, I have volunteered with Surfrider for over 20 years, and I don't like getting up and speaking publicly, but when I read the article in the press last week, I was so bothered by everything that I read that I came out tonight. Um, you know, uh, I want to thank the trustees for taking the time and for contacting a coastal geologist who does not stand to make any money from the project to get a second opinion. Um, and uh, while I personally hate to see the geotubes installed, um, I'd also hate to see this structure fall into the ocean because I think that would have terrible environmental inf effects on our, on our beaches. Um, so I, I will second what a lot of people have said, that if it has to be done, do it temporary, make sure it gets removed, and, and come up with a long-term solution. I think that um, you know a lot of these properties have been under attack by the ocean for a long time, and we should start thinking about what we're going to do with them. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Chris Kamicki. I'm from East Quag. Um, I've pretty much lived in East Quag all my life, and I've always been out in a boat in the Shinnecock Bay and all that. And there's there's constantly sandbars out there, and I'm basically saying if you're always looking for sand like that from Ram Pasture Point to you know all the way across the bay, that there used to be the channel through there years ago. Um, maybe if you need sand, set up a dredge throughout Shinnecock Bay and pump some of them sandbars out of there and fill up. Uh, you know, if you need sand on other locations, I'm not, I'm not saying take the whole sandbar, but it, it's constantly moving every year. And uh, I know down by the inlet, they, they, they set up in the bay one time, but uh, that's really kind of, uh, and, and going through the inlet, is there any, any plans to ever like to hook the inlet to the west a little bit somehow? Because wouldn't, wouldn't that make sense as far as the jetties to shift them to the left so that the, I mean, to the west, I should say. And then when the water comes around, it'll constantly dig that sand out. Instead of making bars out in the ocean, it'll keep pushing it down. I mean, would, has anybody ever looked at that? I mean, I mean that's kind of my theory, because I, when you go out there, you're going through 10 feet of water to 30 feet of water, and, you know, I don't have a huge boat, so I'm not going to bottom out, but uh, <coughs> people do. <laughs> so I guess that's all I have to say. I yeah, I, I can uh, uh, address your uh, comments about the inner bays and the dredging right um, back in the 60s 70s uh, that was a common practice for the Army Corps to hire a uh, you know a dredge and basically pump the material on the barrier beach they haven't done that for uh, many years in the inner bays because right. of the material is very silty and it's not beach uh, material you know, it's not conducive to the it's beach like it's, the it's not compatible and there's always a, there's always a problem but I do remember in like the early mid 70s when we had a washout uh, east of Tyana, um, the uh, Army Corps actually put a pipe right under the Tyana Beach Pavilion, which is still there today, right. to be able to pump the material from the inner bay to the ocean. Right. So I mean, it, it was a practice that was done for decades, but they've abandoned it now. Yeah, because I mean, when you're going from East Quag to the inlet, you got to loop all the way down to past Tyana and go go around instead of I mean. Dredging's a tough. Yeah, tough no, I, I understand yeah. that, but you got a lot of big boats running aground there all the time too. I mean, if if you're not 
paying attention when you're drifting through there, you'll, you'll, you know, I have a 19 foot boat, so I'll, I'll run aground sometime, and then you got to panic and get off the bar before you get swamped. You the know? project that was done this past uh, fall and early winter in Shinnecock Bay mm -hmm. took the uh, Army Corps and the uh, Suffolk County DPW almost three years to uh, get the permits and to be able to do. And initially, they were going to make them pump the material all the way to Road K, but because of the uh, issues that we're, ha we're having there and the trustees had contacted the Army Corps as did the town we had the sand put directly on the beach in front of uh, Oakland's in the co-op. Right. Well, at least there's plenty of sand out there if you need it. That's for sure. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to address the board? I just wanted to correct something. I said, I said 1985 and then 2005 the article I was talking about and I had it. If you like, I can give you a at the end here. Yes, I live this. Okay. Is there anybody else that would like to address the board at this point? Yes. Thank you, Good board. My name is Kevin Serencioni. I live in East Quag. You heard from my parents who live in Quag and my fellow surf rider members. Um, I just thank you, Kevin, for explaining the technical aspects of it, but just from a practical point of view, and I do appreciate the plight of the homeowners there. We're homeowners in Quag, and the, the ocean is right there in front of our property as well. So I, I sympathize with that. But once you okay the hardened structure, even if it's a six month permit, six months or even a year from now, what is gonna change? The beach is not really coming back. You know, maybe the federal government will pump in some sand temporarily, but then these storms keep hammering and you're left with these sandbags there, and then the nice neighbor down, you know, one or two houses, three houses down, he's getting carved out, and he says, oh my God, I have an emergency, now I need the sandbags to protect my property. And it goes on, and we've seen the result in Quag with the pictures, this is what happens. If anybody's been down to the Jersey Shore, you see what really happens in the long term, which is no beach at all, and just steel walls and rocks and, and, and no beach. So once you put this in place, I don't see it ever going away. So then what happens from there? That, that's what I'm just basically submitting to you to think about as you vote on this. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to address the board? Yes, sir. Uh, hi. My name is Bob Tyson. I'm a, a freeholder. I've lived out here all my life, and I am a... Uh, I'm a beachcomber. I've probably spent more time walking between Shinnecock Inlet and Hot Dog Beach than in bed in my life. Okay. Uh, I want to share and dovetail with Kevin. All right. I was part of uh, Dr. Leatherman's and Sandy Shumway's coastal erosion study back in '98 and '99 to address um, a larger hunk of beach for sure. But um, it made me familiar with things that happen uh, along the shoreline that my geology background had not really given me a hands-on account of. Okay, uh, there are hot spots that move along the beach, and when nor'easters come in, sometimes they align uh, with a high tide, with a surge in tide at a critical moment and a particular portion of the beach is scoured. Um, sometimes those hot spots move. Sometimes they are there for decades and decades, right? I have a couple of pictures here and I don't want to bore you with it. Uh, I certainly don't want to bore Mr. Warner because he is very knowledgeable in this area as well, okay? Um, um, this is to share perhaps with the <coughs> residents who live on the shore, all right, that uh, just in my lifetime, and I will go back to uh, 1970 or so, where I can tell you almost where every grain of sand in that part of the beach has moved from and been taken away from. And dunes retreat, not on average, uh, three feet a year. They retreat 
70 feet in one instant and then they're gone forever okay uh, the only place in the town of Southampton where dunes are actually functioning and beach systems are functioning in the way that they ought uh, is the area between uh, Tiana Beach East to Shinnecock Inlet where there are no structures there are two town pavilions uh, I'm not sure if the one at Tiana has much more life in front of it to be perfectly honest okay I used to play volleyball in the 70s and in front of the pavilion at Tiana Beach uh, there was a volleyball court that went lengthwise on the top of the dune uh, that's 60 feet of court and 10 feet at either end of, to the east was a parking lot that was built up on the dunes and there was a storm winter storm of 1992 and I went up there the next day it was all gone right right to the edge of the pavilion and you can look on there you can pull into the parking lot and look right underneath of the pavilion right out to the ocean okay in the 30 years since uh, we've pumped sand in we planted seagrass um, and it's gone again uh, happens in the winter but I will say one thing that the dunes never move back out towards the ocean okay they always move the other way and the <clears throat> by the way I am compassionate I am sympathetic the folk who live around dune you know you that was the first buildings that were built after the hurricane 38 okay after World War two 50s 60 it was built there wasn't another thing around it okay um, and on occasion if I'm not mistaken they have been scoured right up to the toes of the building and uh, you guys have done your due diligence you have brought in sand you have put up beach fences and all your neighbors have too okay but the dune line never really changed the crest of the dune is still where it was so to speak okay might have moved back a little bit but it's it's not moving to the sea and no matter how many bags you put in front of it and no matter how much sand you pile on top of it no matter how much grass you put on top of it that's it okay um, I would recommend to the board um, that oh uh, by the way uh, the Army Corps of Engineer they have sent the reformulated recommendation for west of Shinnecock Inlet and um, there is no sand bypass system in the works there is a sand there is a draft of a reformulation study okay not it that the chief has to okay there is a draft that is being reviewed okay so I don't see any rescue so to speak of this temporary fix that you're asking for okay there's no magic bullet that is going to come out and there is no magic dune restoration there is no magic beach restoration or shoreline okay the the the, the answer to the situation in your is now is 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 dire okay uh, there's there's a lot of people who who will not speak directly I am cursed that I am a direct person okay and and I don't want to see those two front buildings go into the water because it would be a mess it would be a navigational and an environmental horror okay and that is not on you by the way that is on mother nature okay that is something that's beyond all of us and, and, and the folk who have lived there for 20 or 30 years um, I think you know it deep down okay that something needs to be done that these that these band-aids 
are not the answer. Okay, you, you, you genuinely need to uh, be serious about what you need to do to move forward. All right. Um, it, it, it breaks my heart. Okay, I, I love the beach. Uh, if, if, if I lived there, I would be fighting like a dog. Okay, to try to preserve it. Um, you know, good good luck. You know, I, I, I hope that we have a calm winter. I hope that uh, the sand appreciates in front of your building. Uh, but don't be fooled in the short term, okay? You, you folk genuinely need to do something. You guys built something prior to code, and you built it close to the beach, and you got... Uh, you got 70 years out of it, okay? It's a lot more than most folk, all right? Um, I would like to give to the board a couple of pictures here, if I may, mm -hmm. yeah. that might put things, <clears throat> I, you know, I hate being, I don't think I'm the oldest person in the room, okay? But <clears throat> I might have the longest memory. Are you gonna leave them with, the, with us so that we can uh, see Yeah, but I'd like to show you just one if I may, okay? I'm gonna give you the whole thing. Mm -hmm. But if I may, this is 2010, this is 2013, and it's been a hot spot in front of that part of the world forever, okay? And this is November 10th, 2012. And I have a sequence of pictures from 1930 to current, which actually shows hotspot right in front of Round Dune that runs just, comes from just a little bit east of Dolphin Lane that has extended in front of maybe 10 or 12 properties in that part of the world for the last 70 years. And even though there are seasonal changes and even though there is a storm that might lay a little bit more sand up there uh, during the summer or not, uh, the hot, the, the, they've existed. They're there. And I'd like to submit those to you too. Okay. So, in conclusion, I don't want it to. I, I don't want your buildings to fall into the water, okay? And and whatever you can do to get them from here to some sort of pathogenic moment, uh, I hope you can help them out, okay? But I would share with you that a accommodation, once it's given, is subject to extension. And then it would be on you, okay? Just to share. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Mark Barakas, West Hampton, uh, 11977. So first of all, I'd like to thank everyone you because none of you get paid a lot of money and being a trustee is more than a full-time job you all put a lot of uh, time energy effort away from your families uh, a lot of hours with bloodshot eyes doing a lot of research Scott you said you were down there um, this morning you know checking out the situation and I don't think anyone in this room regardless of of their perspective on on the shore hurting situation you know pros versus cons no one in this room wants to wants to see Round Dune go away, you know, go into the ocean. And no one wants to see anyone lose their investment, uh, possibly, you know, generational investments um, that they've inherited. Um, a lot of the folks who, 
who own at Round Dune are some residents, so they're not always to be able to be like feet on the ground out here all the time and, and going to meetings and checking up on, on their beach status. Um, but with that said, a, a couple basic questions here, um, and forgive me if they've already been answered at the last meeting. I wasn't, I wasn't there, I read about this and I decided to come to the public hearing. Um, is how much, how many cubic yards of compatible sand, upland imported sand, would be able to be purchased with with the, um, the the amount of money that they're going to spend on this supposedly six month shore hardening situation i would imagine that they would be able to and and import and and put there over the winter um and continue to put there as it's washed away if this is supposedly a six month uh temporary shore hardening project would it would it be a, a better situation to to spend those funds to just continually buy those cubic yards compatible sand throughout the winter to get them through the winter. Um, that's A. Uh, B, something to consider. Would I, Ed, A, I loved your statement when you said I lived it because each and every person on this board has had decades of experience on the ocean and on the bays and the creeks and that's very much appreciated. Um, and your service over the time you've been on the board is greatly appreciated. Um, you also made a statement relating to the fact that the the geo cubes and Sagaponic are, are have been working, um, or they're they're be it's a it's a better situation down there. They're they're not the sand isn't being swept away as readily from them. Um, am I? Let me correct? clarify that. Yeah, I'm sorry. Quick. I apologize. At the Sandy, uh, I. The, myself and some of the other trustees walked that whole stretch. Yeah. The houses were basically scoured out to the point where you could walk underneath them yeah. and we'll actually walk underneath the gunite pools. Yeah. So they actually put the geo cubes around the pilings foundation okay. and then they reestablished a 100 or 200 foot, you know, bluff and bu uh, berm in front of it. Okay. So they rebuilt it there. They're actually completely covered and no one would even know they were there unless you had walked it and actually seen them being placed in. So right now, they're not causing any issues, but they were issued in a way that they were supposed to be removed. Yeah. Which they weren't. So um, and when, But if, if, if folks want to reference, you know, there's comparing versus contrasting. So if someone wants to... Um, Take, take that example and compare it to the situation to the west of the, the big groins at, on either side of Shinnecock Inlet, um, you, don't, you don't have that, those massive groins out by Sagaponic. You know how you have the, the, the smaller George Gajetis yes. and I mean you guys know, I don't need to. Well, there was also a know. beach nourishment project that was done on top of that. You okay. know, so there, there is a nice wide high beach, uh, manufactured beach in Sagaponic and in Bridgehampton right now. And it has lasted, you know, six or eight years. I'm, I'm not know the exact date. And it's doing very well down there, actually. So what everybody's hoping is that the Army Corps comes along and does a similar project in this area to put a fairly large, wide, high beach. And it will last, you know, eight or 10 years or whatever the life expectancy is and temporarily relieve the erosion along this stretch of uh, beach. Yeah, as, as long as they shorten the groins at, or create a, a sand bypass system to alleviate the, the refraction, you know, that, sure car, that carves out the ball, you know, every time people sneeze. It's like, it's been going on. I spent way too much time on a surfboard when I was a kid because my mom wanted me to be a doctor and I wanted to rebel. So I spent way too many, way too many surf sessions down I'm 46 now I'm, I, I can't you know I, I don't think I've surfed in three years but the point is that um, I have seen this thing 10 years 20 years ago uh, you know in in the water and the surfers get excited when that's in the water because that means all the sand shifts and it creates perfect beach breaks and great waves and whatnot um, so so this has happened before and it will continue to happen because of the length of the groins on other, either side of the inlet. So it's kind of like apples to oranges when you talk about Sagaponic, that's a, that's a great paradigm, you know, but the, the, the littoral uh, conditions down there are much different than just 
down drift of, of Shinnecock Inlet. So that's all I'm asking. And I think it's an amazing thing that you're considering hiring Dr. Young. I want to thank you, Ed, for, for making that call and talking to him this morning. And uh, again, thank each and every one of you for, for your service. So thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to address the board at this time? Close the hearing. I need a second. second. All in favor? All right. Mr. Warner, on behalf of African, thank you uh, for the time this evening you've devoted. Uh, you've uh, closed, uh, you know, your public comment section. Uh, is the board prepared to act? Um, I think we are. I think we've uh, done our work and uh, done as much research as we could. You provided us, I believe, with our adequate uh, answers to the questions that we had initially uh, <coughs> put to you. So I'd like to uh, take an action. Thank you. Application for round dune uh, 101, Dune Road East Cork, Suffolk County, tax map 900, 385 2 14, body of water, Atlantic Ocean. It was tabled uh, until uh, this meeting. I'd like to uh, take a vote on on it, but I also. You want to open up the discussion amongst the board? Yes, I want to open a discussion amongst the board. You got it. You got and it. Also, I want to uh, read into the record our special conditions that we are. Well, well, we got to make a motion to amend the yep. amendment as it is to include the special conditions right. one through nine. Yep. But to make that motion, that the, the permit, if adopted, uh, it requires these uh, nine special conditions yep. to be added to it. If so I might I, add, also there was no there was no mention in the special conditions of an expiration date, which you're going to have to bring up if you're going to make a temporary permit. Yes. Okay. And I believe you had said something about the town permit. Yes. Um, the permit, as the uh, Conservation Board has given uh, Round Dune, I'd like uh, our permit to mirror the time frame of, the, uh, of that permit. Six months and a three-month possible extension. So, I'd like to amend the uh, post uh, application for Round Dune 101 East Quag to include the nine special conditions. Any second on that? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The nine conditions are Committee should construct and maintain the GeoCube's erosion control devices, the devices in accordance with the plans on file with the application for this permit in the Office of the Board of Trustees. Committee agrees to weekly inspections by the Board of Trustees and or an agent hired their designation to monitor the conditions in the beach and dune system. Number two, permittee shall have a continuing obligation to maintain the devices, beach, and dune system in suitable condition, which shall include but not limited the sand replenishment, dune restoration, beach nourishment, and any other modifications that may be necessary to, uh, to maintain the devices and dune system in suitable condition in the event that the maintenance of the devices or the beach dune system shall be needed during the period from April 1st to August 31st, 2019, it is agreed that, what, 2020. Sorry, make the amendment. It is agreed that by, that there no work of any kind shall be undertaken without permit, uh, the permittee having first obtained all necessary permits from the uh, applicable federal and state agencies having jurisdiction over endangered species. 
condition number three, permittee shall have a continuing obligation to remove the geocubes if it is determined by the town trustees in the future after due notice that the devices have caused, contributed, or resulted adverse coastal impacts which endangers or creates substantial risks of harm for a substantial period of time to other properties, the beach, the dune system, suitable interfaces with the easement in favor of the public over the subject and adjoining properties. Number four, the permit acknowledges that the obligations imposed by the conditions of this permit shall constitute obligations in favor of the freeholders and commonality of the town of Southampton and may be enforced by the South Board of Trustees in a court competent jurisdiction in order to enforce their rights on behalf of the taxpayers and the freeholders of the town of Southampton. Number five, in the event that the permittee violates any condition of this permit or fails to perform any obligations imposed by the conditions of this permit, the town trustees or its agents, including <coughs> Southampton town employees and independent, and independent contractors upon reasonable notice that then the owner may be entering upon a subject parcel to remove the devices or otherwise cure such violations or failure. Using the security supplied here within the, to the extent necessary to pay for the cost of the same. In the event that such cost exceeds the security, the permittee agrees that shall, uh, such excess may be assessed and levied upon and against said uh, such subject parcels and collected by the town of Southampton in a manner provided by the law of the town real estate property taxes and assessment. <clears throat> Number six, within 10 days of date hereof, the permittee shall deliver to the trustees a performance bond in the amount from an accept uh, and, and form acceptable to the trustees to secure performance of the special conditions contained herein <coughs> along with such supporting documents that the trustees may reasonably request. The permittee agrees to identify the town trustees, the town of Southampton, their employees and agents from any damages associated with and resulting from the installation or the removal of the geocubes or actions to cure any violations of the permit or special conditions. Failure to comply with these conditions show Rendered the permit null and void. Ab into Abinicio. Ab Sorry. It's okay. Permittee shall supply an as built survey of the structures, <coughs> hereby authorizing showing the relation to, uh, of the other structures in the lots on either side of the subject parcel as establishing a baseline topographic state of the subject property within 15 days of the completion of the construction. The conditions of this permit and the obligations imposed by such conditions shall be binding upon the current owner of the subject parcel and all subsequent owners to the subject parcel in the event of the title to the same in conveyed while the permit is in force and in effect. The trustees shall have the opinion of requiring a current owner to execute, acknowledge, <coughs> record in the Suffolk County Clerk's a declaration incorporating the obligations imposed by the conditions of this permit and imposing such conditions and obligations as covenants running with the land. Such de declaration shall be submitted to the attorney for the trustees to approve prior to the recording. Those are the nine special conditions. Motion to amend on the floor and a second. Second. Any we, we already okay, okay all right motion to amend on the floor seconded it all in favor aye, aye. aye. motion uh, to, adopt. to adopt the uh, proposal as amended. as amended second all in favor aye, aye. thank you mr president thank you board thank you Wait, can we call the roll? Yes. I screwed up. I'm sorry. Okay, you want to do a roll? Have to record.
call the motion. How do we do that? Joe. How do we do that? We have to do a motion for you all. And then we can call the motion. Okay. Folks, we still have business with the transaction. Yes. All right, folks. You guys, if you guys could, if you're going to exit, please, please, you can please sit down. The or, meeting has to continue. We yes. have to do something procedurally. All right. So, all right. I'd like to recall the motion for a formal roll call vote. Folks, we just have your attention. We need to be quiet. Guys. Guys. Oh. Could you please? Please. All right. Motion on the floor for a recall. We need a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Okay. Um, President Warner. Yes. Uh, Secretary Treasurer Horowitz. Yes. Trustee Pell is absent. Uh, Trustee Stafford. Yes. Trustee Welker. No. Alicia my heart, uh, just with an explanation. Uh, my heart goes out to you homeowners mm -hmm. in the Round Dune complex. What a difficult situation to be in. But I cannot sit here in good conscience as a tra town trustee entrusted to take care of the public speech and not have coupled with this vote a long-term plan for this area. It is in conscionable and a critical omission therefore my vote is no because at the state at the town and at the trustee level we are not looking to the future how can we as residents of this community as homeowners in this community not look to the future we cannot continue to act in the way we are. There is a new paradigm that needs to begin. Where will it begin? Trustee Resolution 2019. Uh, any conversations can we please have outside or in the hallway? We have more business that we need to continue with. Thank you very much. Please. Please. Yes. All right. Charles, we ready? All right. Trustee Resolution 2019-397, amend the uh, Board of Trustees 2019 adopted bu uh, budget for the New York State Department of Education Local Government Records Management Improvement Fund Grant. Need a second on that? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Trustee Resolution 2019-398 for the budget transfer transfers various GLs. We need a second on second. that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Trustee Resolution 2019-399 399 Resolution to amend the Board of Trustees fee schedule for 2020. I need a second on that. All in favor? Aye. 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 Trustee the Resolution 2019-400. Authorized payment to Dr. Gobler of Stony Brook University for Lake Agarum study. I need a second on that. All second. 
All in favor? Aye. Aye. Trustee Resolution 2019-401, authorizing the opening of Sag Pond. Table Mother Nature took care of that, so we're going to table that one. Thank you, Mother Nature. Well, can I make a recommendation that we, uh, it goes to January uh, 6th, if something in the environment closes it up and we need to open it, why don't we just leave it? No, why don't we, why don't we adopt it in case we need? Yeah, they adopt it in case we need it. In case we need it, because if, because if it closes up and we get a severe northeaster, then we're going to need to. Yeah. Okay, so uh, Bruce, you for the second? Please. Yes. Okay. I need it. Everybody in favor? Aye. 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 And we have one walk on. Authorizes the purchase of office furniture. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 To adopt the uh, walk on, I need a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Does anybody else have any other business? If not, I'd like to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.